Welcome to the Who's Counting podcast with Cleta Mitchell, the podcast about America's elections. Hello, welcome to this episode of Who's Counting with Cleta Mitchell. This is a podcast about everything having to do with elections, how elections are supposed to be run, how sometimes they're not run the way they're supposed to be, and what we as citizens can do about it. And today, we have a wonderful guest with us who is going to talk to us about uh, some amazing work that she and fellow uh, patriots in Tennessee are doing. And I want to welcome Kathleen Harms, who chairs the Tennessee Fair and Free Elections Coalition. So, uh, Kathy, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you for having us here. Thank you. So let's start with a little bit about you. Tell everybody a little bit about yourself and your background and how you got involved in working on saving elections in Tennessee. Well, I am just a, I'm a grandmother. I live in the state of Tennessee for 10 years, um, spent a lot of time in New England, but we've uh, made this home. This is our home. Our children are here. And when COVID hit in the in 2020, my daughter came to me and I was kind of happy that the next generation was interested in what was going on in their government. So we started a heritage uh, sentinel group at my house and it was a pretty good sized group. But then after the 2020 election rolled around and things kind of got a little bit more exciting around elections, we started a kind of a branch off into election integrity. And then after a while, I had determined that for my time, in order to do this, we really had to focus. And so we have, fo- I, I was focusing on elections for the longest time. And I had been getting requests to speak around the state. And I, because we only said three things, authenticate the uh, voter, authenticate the count and authenticate the ballot. Those three things, that's really, it's kind of pretty mindless. It's uh, That's okay. what I have to do. Say those three things again. Well, in the right order is authenticate the voter, authenticate the, ba- the ballot, and authenticate the count. Three okay. parts to any election. You have to have an eligible voter, you have to have an a authenticated ballot, and you have to have a proper an, an, and an accurate count. So those were the three issues. So I started getting calls to talk to groups across the country, I mean, across the state, and that took a lot of time, but I was happy to do it just to help people understand There are no silver bullets here. There is not one thing that's an election. Elections have different parts and different components, but they are an ecosystem. You're not going to solve one thing with it. Everything kind of blends and goes because it is a process. It's not just one piece of an event. And so as I got deeper down the rabbit hole, I had already been working at up in um, Nashville on other legislative issues. So I took that experience a little bit that I had, and I bought myself my own TCA, Texas Code Annotated Book uh, from LexisNexis, and I started looking what are the laws that we do have on the books. Because you're, I'm hearing so many people and so many levels discussing um, elections. And then I was really blessed um, this last fall to meet uh, with Andrea Gomez with Citizens for Renewing America, who said, you know, my focus is going to be to help start a state election coalition, which is really what was needed. You had people popping up everywhere, different voices, everybody fighting on uh, different turf, so to speak. But we needed to come together as a state and voila, Election Integrity Network. And Cleta, I was always a fan of yours. Okay. I got to know you by watching you on TV back with the Lois Learner days. Mm-hmm. And I thought if Cleta Mitchell's involved with this, I can we can do this because this is someone with integrity. Election Integrity Network has a lot of integrity, and we know that they're working on many levels. And as soon as we started working with you, it changed everything at, for the, for our state. And when we and we were able to then launch last fall in Tennessee our own state coalition, and that's how we got started. That's amazing. I love that. I love that. It's always gratifying to think that something that you're working on that people say, "Yeah, I want to do that." So that's great. Um, so talk a little bit, Kathy, about um, tell us about your coalition. Tell us what kinds of things uh, you have been working on. And uh, and I would like to drill down a moment. I really like the way you've broken that down. Authenticate the voter, authenticate the ballot, authenticate the count. That's pretty simple to say, but not easy to do. No, not at all. 
And when you break it out that way, that's when you can start talking to people who get off on a tangent of one, just one thing. And let's, and I'm not, a, I'm, everything is important, but I, I'll give you a good, for instance, if you got rid of technology tomorrow in the election process, it doesn't mean you have a, a fair election because we have discovered because of the citizens research working group, all of the nonprofits that are involved in our elections. And we're really getting to the point where billionaires and millionaires are pouring so much money into the voter registration process, activating, and we'll get it, maybe get into this a little bit later, activating groups through that process. And that can change an election. How an election is administered can change an election. It's technology is a critical p- component and it is one of the working groups. And that's the great thing about the election integrity network. It is a, it's a multifaceted uh, national working groups that we can then glean from and develop and mirror those at the state level. And that's what we're trying to do. And in Tennessee, our biggest challenge is to change the narrative from the voter experience being the priority for our secretaries of state and flip that back to accuracy and fair and free elections. I know that we're, we don't ever have to say somebody has bad motives in an election, but we do have to challenge the process. And I think that's healthy. Well, I do too. You know, one of the things that I've become really realized that for decades, because as you point out, there are all these leftist groups, they're advocacy groups, they have a certain perspective, which is their number one concern or issue or goal is to do what they call expand the electorate. If, and it sounds good, it sounds fine to expand the electorate. I want everybody who uh, is eligible to vote to register and vote and be an informed voter and participate. What I don't want is just to dump people into the system who may not even know they're in the system, and and to have third-party advocacy groups and political operatives basically just herd them in to cast a ballot, whether it's informed or not informed, or they care about one thing, or they barely know anything about the election, and maybe they don't even want to vote. Maybe they don't want to register, but that the whole idea of just expanding the electorate and what has happened as a result of that is that all these election administrators, just like you referenced, they think their job is to get people to go vote. Well, that's not their job. That's the job of the candidates and the political parties. And when I say things like this, they say, oh, you're a vote suppressor. No, I'm just saying everybody has a job to do. The job of the election administrator is to administer the elections so that they're conducted honestly in accordance with the law and that people can get in and out and vote and they, they know their vote, their ballots being counted mm-hmm. the way they intended. I don't know, but honestly, that is, when I say that, they say that I'm an evil person, I can tell you, because I've got all the emails. I'm an evil person because I say, that's not the job of the election official. And it's not their job because it takes the eye off the ball of the more serious and concerning issues. When you change the narrative to becoming about a voter experience or just hurting people in, as you say, to vote, then you create systems around that that are not necessarily safe. And I'll give you a good example. And it's one that you and I've spoken about, the vote center, for, exa- for example. Oh, now, yes. I want you to talk about this whole business of precinct versus uh, vote center. This is a huge issue. And you're the number one person on this in the whole country. Well, we're fighting it because we have an, we do have a constitution in the state of Tennessee that in Article 1, it speaks about free and fair, free and equal elections, and also about giving the General Assembly this narrow uh, capacity to legislate, to law, to make law, to allow people to vote in the precincts in which they may reside. Well, that sounds pretty clear cut until you start really getting into how they've kind of gotten around that. And again, that is, I believe, a lot of other groups that are not government groups have influenced that because it also relates to the voter rolls. And that's not, it's not just the election process. It's the voter rolls. When you bring in these groups that come in and they do registering, and we found a loophole in our own election law uh, just in the last few weeks, because I noted because of uh, Ned Jones and the fabulous work he does on citizens research, we had our groups doing the all in challenge, looking at that on the college campuses and in other areas. Well, I got a call from Shelby County from one of the great people that are working out there 
And she sent me a text because of a, a group called Vote America registering people, young people, they mobilized people in a nanosecond on buses for a, a, for an activist purpose. And so now we're using, and we and you get these conglomerations and, and populations of specific demographics. And we all just saw there was a um, an email that was sent out that they're going after the rural young voter. Well, how are they going to do that? Well, you've got to get them where they live. And if they can go in and do this massive voter registration, sign them up and vote there, vote at that place, then you've got nobody checking the voter rolls. When you go back to precincts, precincts, our founders could never have um, anticipated the use of a machine to vote on any more than an atomic bomb. They A pencil and a paper was probably all they ever thought about. Precincts where you live would not have ever been the idea that you can digitize a precinct. It was an analog thought that you live where you vote. And it's the only way, in my opinion, to have free and equal access. Because when you go to the idea that it's for the voter experience and convenience, now you have limited that experience for the convenience of certain populations, not everybody. So for instance, in my county, we have seven early voting centers for early voting and 25 on election day, but we used to have 43 precincts. Mm. See, that is, how can you say that's free and equal access? And they're not in the anywhere possibly where you live. You might have to drive 10 miles to get to the to the voting booth. And that did happen in an election in August in a primary where they closed five of those seven early voting centers for half of the election, half of the early voting process. They reopened them in the second half. Well, they the, what happens, that's not equal distribution across the county. In, in, it's not in the neighborhood anymore. And then you just compound all of that after you get past the fact that you're not, it's suppressing vote. I think we have to use that term that the left learns. You are actually suppressing vote in the name of convenience because what's convenient for a, an individual who's working in an office complex in a in a commercial area is may not be convenient for the stay at home mom with right. small kids who could have gone down the street to her school and voted. So we're we're doing that. We're, we could be uh, in my belief in the data we've pulled. There is. Um, a case to be made for voter suppression, but then you get to the voter rolls. So now what do you have to do? You have to have a lot of technology to have a vote center because you have ballot types in every county that every precinct could be different. So you could have a hundred different ballot types. Well, you can't have paper floating around in a vote center for every ballot type. So they put them on a computer, right? Well, and you don't have poll books that you can look people up with you know, pencil and paper and look them up. You have to have e-poll books. Well, that's putting your technology to work, but in a way that could be um, making your vote, voting rolls very vulnerable, just technology-wise, plus the people working in those centers are not familiar with the streets. We had in uh, Davidson that's County. Good. That's in, a very good point. Well, in Davidson County in August, there was a huge mess up because of the change of redistricting where thousands of people got the wrong ballot. Oh. So, so that is not a hypothetical problem. And so you might get the wrong ballot type. I had an election commissioner in another county get the wrong ballot type. An election commissioner in her own county got the wrong ballot type. But that's because we don't, we can't expect our volunteers and our wonderful people who work at the polls to understand all this technology. And when they're demonstrating this, Stuff. This young guy was looking at it one day at an e poll book. And he looked at it, it was a Microsoft tablet. He was in the operating system in five minutes and everybody's hair caught on fire in the room. Oh, wait, stop, stop. So you're saying that he he was, when you say he was in it in five minutes, I drill he, he, down on that a little bit. So you're standing there looking at a demonstration. Right. He's, he's at a demonstration in his county with one of the major um, election um, uh, vendors and they hand out the e poll books for everybody to look at. at and he's a young guy. He's a computer guy. He takes one look at it and says, oh, I could probably get into the system, you know, because he could. It's He said, you can't really call it hacking because it's just a Microsoft tablet made in China. And he said, I would, he would, and he didn't mean to do anything wrong, but technically 
everyone's like, well, you just committed a felony. And I said, I want them to charge them with a felony because if they do, we'll just show how incredibly vulnerable this thing is. But you see, we layer upon layer without thinking, thinking we're doing, this is the unintended negative consequences of doing what they think is good. Well, you know, the the thing that is interesting to me is that uh, I found a presentation that I had made 10 years ago in which um, I'd read an article about uh, lawmakers from across the country uh, from uh, the progressive side had met in Washington and they had come up with a list of all the things they were going to do to change our voting system. We One of those was getting rid of precinct voting. That was on their list. I mean, and if you look at the list, they've done all of it. They've, they've spent literally hundreds of millions of, if not billions of dollars changing the way we vote. And you're right. I mean, when we're talking about precinct voting, it's the idea historically had been that everybody in a precinct all got the same ballot because you had the same city council person, the same state rep, the same state senator, the same I mean, the county commissioner. And, and, and Congress and all, and so you all got the same ballot. They would know historically about how many people would be voting, so they knew how many ballots were needed. They, they, they could prepare the supply chain. And in most states, then they would, you know, you go in, you get your ballot, you know the people who vote there, they know the streets, as you point out. Uh, it's closer to home, it's close to where you live. And, uh, and, they have to reconcile before they can certify that the number of votes matches the number of ballots, matches the number of voters who voted. And that's all gone now. So it's a huge issue. It's a huge problem. It and is. we have to return to something that can be accountable. Like you say, it can be accountable. When you remove things, when you centralize anything, you lose control. You have to, because you're not down there at the granular level where you can check and balance all of these things. And it's not that the local election officials fault that that has happened, but it has happened and it has to be rectified. And you saw in many states and in our state, we had long, long lines at these vote centers. It's just common sense that when you limit the amount of places a person can vote, you're going to have longer lines. But you and know, one of the things they want to do, Kathy, I'm for, I firmly believe that they want to create the long lines so that what's the answer then? Oh, well, let's all vote by mail. And there you have zero supervision, zero verification, zero accountability. Well, we have already the technology and the major vendors for online voting. Online. 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 online the major vendors and online integrating our poll books with them is, I think, a, a, just a disaster of an idea. And all, and so you're getting, you, you, we've seen these things come up as that there were problems in elections. I would uh, venture a guess that most of them are in vote centers because that's where the, the ballots are out of control. You know, we've talked with Garland many times about he wanted the ballot images, but then they can change the ballot image. So even in the state of Tennessee, I don't know a state where you can actually get your hands on those ballots themselves. And when you say you should be able to validate the amount of people who came in to vote to the amount of ballots, we tried to be able to reconcile what was on the tabulator count with just fingering how many ballots there were. We couldn't even get that passed this year in, in Tennessee. Well, I think I think that we're going to have to do a major uh, educational program because I don't think that most, I was at a meeting earlier this week and I made the statement with this group of people that they said, well, what, what would be some of the things you would do? And I said, I think we need to have a national uh, program. Maybe we call it do the math. I don't know, but, uh, but to reconcile, just like a, a grocery store clerk can't go home until the cash store balances. The bank teller can't go home until the cash store balances. And the idea, I said, I said, you know, the number of votes that are certified out of a voting location needs to match the number of ballots. There needs to be, that's why we have chain of custody for ballots, so that if a ballot gets spoiled, well, you account for that. And, you know, and if uh, it's a provisional ballot, you account for that. And, but the number of votes matches the number of ballots, matches the number of people who showed up to vote or who cast a ballot in that 
and and these people looked at me and said, wait a minute, are you saying that that isn't done? We just assumed that that was the way it was done. I said, well, you would assume wrong. It's the way it should be done. And some state laws require it, but I promise you, it is not being done. Well, when you go to vote centers, first of all, as you said, you, unless you're going to start doing geofencing to find out where people are going to show up, you're never going to have possible, you're going to run out of supplies. You're going to run out of ink. The technology we found out on those optical scanners are not made for that kind of volume. After so many ballots that are tabulated through them, they're supposed to be serviced. That's why we have so many of them breaking down. Oh, so during the process, I didn't know that, Kathy. Well, we, well, our technology person found this one out. And then, you know, you add to that the fact that in a precinct, there's a by law, there's a limited amount of people. They're finite. There's 6,000 voters in a precinct in the state of Tennessee max. You can even make them smaller. You can then account for it. We just had a wonderful reorg of one of our uh, party political parties this week. And one of the big concerns was going to be how are we going to vote because they had a state record turnout for this one county of 600 people. And so they didn't know how, how are they going to do it? Well, I've had so much resistance to a handmarked paper ballot. They used a handmarked paper ballot. They did run it through the scanner, which is where the backup was, but less than an hour, 600 people got through because you can get through so many people with that secure handmarked paper ballot. And you're only going to have that's 600. If you've got 6,000 people registered, they don't all show up. You can account for that. You don't need as many early voting days. Uh, our, in our state, it's five to 20, but for some reason, everybody goes to the max. Right. And you don't need that kind of time. But you could also then, I'm not going to say don't use optical scanners, but why we have so many days after an election before we have to certify. Why don't we have a backup of a hand count to sort of to make sure that the optical scanner matched the actual ballot count. That's easy. It shouldn't, it's not a lot more money. It's probably cheaper. You would think I was, we were, I had lobsters crawling out of my ears when I made these kinds of comments. <laughs> well, I, you know, one thing you always have to remember when you're talking to legislators is that it's, they like the system that exists because that's how they got elected. So what could possibly be wrong with the system if it elected, if it produced a wonderful uh, legislative specimen such as me, you know, so exactly. always. So it's, it is a real educational process. And we're starting at the tail end of a 10 year multi hundreds of millions of dollars campaign to, uh, I think, you know, it's a narrative that it, people have just been brainwashed thinking um, that all the election officials, that their job is to go out and get more people to vote. No, just make sure the equipment works. Make sure that you have transparency. Make sure you have accountability. Make sure the workers know what the statutes say. Um, so, you know, that's the thing that I think we've got a lot of work to do on that. And we can, we're we not going to be able to do that without the engagement of citizens. Um, I just keep telling people, it's just like, it's just like parents going to school board meetings. We just kind of we just kind of said, oh, we just thought they were doing a good job and we didn't pay attention. And now we're paying attention. Now we're going, whoops, we need to be here. <laughs> well, yeah, it's like you got to go in and clean out the barn once in a while and get the mice out because they're there and everything looks good on the surface. But you got to get past the window dressing. And I have learned the pot, the lesson that you have always said, be right, but be polite. Go into your election offices. And I I am not in, 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 uh, an, in an adversarial relationship with the people who handle the elections. Uh, we're not in agreement, but you can be polite about not agreeing. On the other hand, at, after that um, whole thing that happened this week and they did the hand mark paper ballot, I made sure I sent a text and said, thank you. Job well done. Well done. You know, good for you. You, you figured out a way to do something that was going to be difficult. And even with our voter rolls and education, I think that's a real major key that you just picked up on. You're educating all of us. We all, and people intuitively have figured, Rasmussen will tell you, a lot. people don't trust our elections. They just right. don't. And our, we, our secretaries of state and our legislators don't want to come to that re realization, but they don't. But being educated as at the state level, we need to understand how the process works. So we encourage the people in our, and I'm just so proud of the people in our state coalition. I'm so proud of them coming forward. They're from all the way from Knoxville to Memphis, and it's a long state. It's a long state. It's a very long state. I've driven across it several and times. And they're bringing 
their expertise or their interests to the table. They've done such great work, but you start by getting a group of people educated and the place we tell them to start is on your vote on your national working group calls because that's where so many people have done the hard work that's where we connect on the national level on some of the good work like we did today on what's happening we get such good reports and then we start the hard work in our state to do the same and so today i had hardly had to talk it was so great we had a great voter um role uh, update what's happening in our state we had um, our the whole citizens research, what was going on with that and how that plays in. And Ned was on the call. And everybody is now, now that it takes a while to get everybody firing on all cylinders. But then the next thing is to say, you've got to be educated on your law. You Because every state is different. You can't, it's not a one size fits all and it shouldn't be. But when you go into your state, we talked about this today, to get the LexisNexis, whatever your code is, find out and find out if there's rules that are promulgated to enforce because not always. And sometimes they're not good. And sometimes they haven't been updated. But then you have to educate your legislators. So you don't take a you don't take 20 activists and just set them loose all over uh, Cordell Hall in Nashville. You'll scare them. You take some educated people. They educate them. And we're going to start a listening tour summer, I think, here. Um, listening, I want to ask, what, tell me, as a legislator, tell me where we're going wrong on this. Tell me what what is your problem with this. Let me explain to you some other laws in other states. That's the other major thing that the EIN does for us. It brings us a wealth of information from other states, where it succeeded with the, and where the pitfalls are. And we have learned a lot and gleaned. And I just today had a conversation um, offline after our call that we had to get information on the SAVE program. And Virginia has done some outstanding work. Florida has done some outstanding work. And I could pass that legislation along because we have to change things at the legislative level. It, uh, it, eventually, it has to be changed there. So when you're talking about the SAVE program, you're talking about the verification of citizenship database. Yes, yes. Yeah. So that we know we passed legislation last year in Tennessee that illegals couldn't vote. But then on the other hand, we watered down the legislation that the secretary of state must uh, check that that uh, for, you know, not for people who don't are are illegal that aren't signing up. I mean, we're talking more DACA, those kinds of um, citizens. And so we're, that got watered down. So we were trying to just flip it back to where it was. And so, I, and so Virginia helped me there. Yeah, well, that's that, you know, that's so important because we learn and we also see patterns. We see uh, there's a pattern going on right now that really started in the last really started in 2021. But because now citizens are engaged in the process, going to election offices, asking questions, obtaining copies of voter rolls, looking at the voter rolls, looking at the process and basically saying we're, we're, we want to be here, we want to know what's going on, that's been perceived as a threat by many, many election officials. And even if they didn't feel threatened, they're told they should be threatened by having citizens. And as you say, our, our mantra is always be right, but be polite um, and be persistent. But um, this narrative that somehow having citizens involved in the election process that that should, you know, that they should criminalize uh, threats, mm -hmm. harassment, or intimidation, and even the Justice Department had this set up this hotline mm -hmm. where people, election officials, could call in and say or if they were feeling threatened or harassed or intimidated, and there were over about eleven 1 hundred calls over fourteen months, which is actually not that many, but in any event, and of those, there were fewer than one hundred that they even felt. Uh, were worthy of subsequent investigation. And of those that were investigated, they had four prosecutions. None of them involved citizens engaged at the election office. None of them involved poll observers. Uh, it, it all, there were, I think, two Instagram posts and, and, and two phone calls. Mm -hmm. But you know, some people think that it's the threat if a FOIA request is a threat or an intimidation or harassment. So 
Well, we, we did have problems beginning um, in our last primary here in an election in November, where all of a sudden we, we start training poll watchers. We took the we, we took the cue from whatever um, Virginia did and hundreds of poll watchers. And we had a hard time getting them approved to be able to walk, be at the polls. And it was even the political parties not wanting to do it. And I was like, what's going on? And then I started paying attention to what you just said, the trends, the pushback, not to, we couldn't, even getting poll workers, they say they need them, we, our people sign up and they don't get called. So we've got to find out where where is that exactly coming from, trying to make it more difficult. Transparency should be, even the Carter Institute says, elections should be transparent, they should be simple, and they should be auditable. Those three things. If we're not going to be transparent, you breed more uh, disrespect and more concern and people don't have confidence. So we want them to understand that we're there to help and to make it a better process for everybody, because I don't understand where that's coming from, except to say we want to keep it behind the curtain. And that's never a good idea. So we have to learn how are we going to change that narrative because we had the problem right here in Tennessee. Well, I think, you know, one of the things that some states are doing, some uh, election integrity groups are doing, or they're pushing for a poll observer's bill of rights uh, or voter's bill of rights, then that one of those things, the, pur the purpose of the poll observer is to observe the election process. And all but two states have a statutory uh, provision for poll observers, and um, and you're supposed to have access to be a meaningful access to be able to see the voting process, to be the tabulation process, the check-in process, not to interfere, but just to observe and to report back on what you've seen. And I will say this: people say, "Well, it didn't do as much good in 2022 as we thought it would." Well, yes, it did. Mm -hmm. Yes, it did. And you know, I'll just take Maricopa County for an example. We had hundreds and hundreds of people, volunteers, and some of them even moved into positions as working the polls, mm -hmm. uh, even during that process. And so when this, and they saw, and they documented everything they saw. They couldn't change it, but they documented it. So now when you have the, the chief election officials of Maricopa County saying that everything was fine on November 8th of 2022, no problem, it was all resolved. Well, we have hundreds and hundreds of eyewitness accounts saying, oh, contraire, <laughs> everything was not fine. And now we know what needs to be fixed Now dealing with those two officials to make sure that they are fixed. But they, you know, look, they have these giant voting centers. Mm -hmm. That was where the problems were. The printers could not keep up with printing the ballots. And, you know, it's like Starbucks. You go in and you get a customized ballot. And so... Right. <laughs> Well, yeah. that's that, and that's so simple. And it's such a, it's a, it's like you said, it, it's a historical understanding of, of the foundation of our country. And when Benjamin Franklin said, ma'am, I gave you a republic if you can keep it, that just begs self governance. And we have been all guilty, I think, over the years of just delegating that role out. Well, citizens are engaged at the school level to the um to the election office and i think that's good and i think that it should be applauded we had legislation passed just yesterday that got all this fanfare that high schoolers will be notified when they're eligible to vote i wrote and said if they had a civics class they would know that they we don't need a law we need to inform people it's their obligation to keep the republic because it's a privilege voting is a privilege that not every country has. And that is critical to get that inf that that kind of partnership back with our government. Well, I also think, you know, that when I talk about expanding the electorate, uh, that that's the left's uh, mantra. Well, that for them, that means including non-citizens. That includes 15 and 16 year olds, 16, 17 year olds. They're talking about lowering the voting age and letting non-citizens vote. The D.C. City Council passed a law that lets literally allows um, uh, citizens of the uh, of China, uh, the, the CCP, Russian citizens, li you know, living in D.C., it allows them to vote in D.C. elections. Now, how crazy is that? But they would say that 
because I say, well, I actually think that American citizens should be the only people who should vote in the D.C. elections or San Francisco or New York City or all the places where they're expanding the electorate to include non-citizens. They would call that vote suppression. And I would say I plead guilty. I think I should. Su we should suppress non-citizens and keep them from voting in our elections. I, I plead guilty. Well, we need to be the gatekeepers because uh, otherwise it, it becomes a toehold, becomes a foothold, becomes a stronghold. If it's allowed in one place, it's going to spread like wildfire. And it, we have to use good laws that are happening around this country so that I can, I can take it in Tennessee and say, look at the good work Virginia's done. Look at the good work um, Missouri's done. Look at the good work Michigan is in Illinois, Ohio. And then we are on the same page and we can get our, our election officials to work together and we have to watch, the, we have to be the, we have to be gatekeepers because who's training those people? Because yeah. again, we found in Shelby County, they went to Pasadena, these election workers, and were trained by very left-leaning groups. Who's yeah. training Who yeah. Who's training the trainer? Well, that's right. And, uh, and we're seeing that all over the country because as I say, they've had this, uh, they've had this all to themselves. And we haven't been there, but now we're there and we're not going to go away. No, we're not. Thank you so much for everything you do for us. Well, thank you, Kathy. I uh, really appreciate what you're doing. What are your primary uh, areas that you're going to be focused on over the next little bit? Precincts is number one. I'm sticking to that. I'm actually going to look and see if we have to uh, litigate that because um, it is pretty clear and it crosses over into so many aspects of the election process. It's not just the where you vote. It's the, the poll books is, and the voter registration is an issue. I'm also going to be concentrating on the loopholes on our vo voter registration drives by um, nonprofit organizations and also um, looking to look at the um, other aspects of what is happening te with technology that we can use to our benefit too. And then I'm trying to learn as much as I can as I'm on your, on your calls. Well, we appreciate all that you're doing. Those are very, like I say, you're leading the way in the country on precinct voting. And I, I'm, I, that's a really good uh, model for other states. They need to look at what their statutes and their constitutions say. And I think we need to start a movement for uh, precinct voting. So good for you. We'll be helping out every way that we can. Thank you, Cleta, for everything you guys do. Well, thank Everyone. you. And thank you so much for taking time to be with us. I know you've had a very busy day. Every day is very busy, but thank you for your commitment to saving our elections and helping to save the Republic that Dr. Franklin uh, told that woman in Philadelphia that he had, he and the others had given to us, if we can keep it. We can keep so. it. Thank you. Thank you, Cleta. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, thank you so much for joining us. That's uh, this episode of Who's Counting with Cleta Mitchell. We hope that you will uh, subscribe. Uh, visit our website at www.whoscounting.us. Uh, sign up to help. If you live in Tennessee, there's a coalition there waiting for you to join them and help them do all this great work they're doing. But do sign up uh, to subscribe to the podcast, but sign up to become part of the election integrity movement. We have coalitions and task forces and working groups all over the country. So subscribe, share the podcast, and join us again next week for another episode of Who's Counting. Thanks so much, and we'll see you again. Counting with Cleta Mitchell, the podcast about America's elections. Please help us fight big tech censorship. Like and subscribe to this podcast, and be sure to share it with your friends. You can become part of this election integrity movement by signing up to join the Election Integrity Network. Go to whoscounting.us. The Who's Counting podcast is produced by the Election Integrity Network.